Um, so welcome everyone to this week's Thursday seminar. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Eva Schreiker telling us some things today. Eva, of course, needs no introduction. Uh, but for the record, I will say uh, Eva received her uh, AB from Harvard uh, and then did her PhD at Berkeley uh, before returning to Cambridge uh, as a CFA post or as postdoc at the CFA. Uh, she then joined the faculty at the University of Maryland College Park um, and was there for several years before coming up to Princeton uh, in 2012. And she is now the Lyman Center Junior Fellow, not Fellow, sorry, Professor um, in the Department of Astrophysics. Eve is, you know, an expert in many things, including, of course, star formation, planet formation. The uh, thermodynamics of the interstellar media, turbulence. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly forgetting many things. Also, you know, computational and, and uh, numerical methods. Uh, and so we're incredibly excited to have an expert tell us uh, or give us a modern primer on. Great. Thank you very much, George. Thanks for coming, everyone. So this is kind of a, a recap of a lecture I gave uh, since I'm filling in for, I forget who the speaker was originally, but uh, I'm happy to fill in. I'm really enjoying my visit here, it's been great. Um, so I gave this a lecture at the Kavli Institute a few weeks ago, um, and then I added and subtracted some things to you know the, the things that I felt like were a little bit more interesting and less general, of, you know, some new interesting things. Um, and I took out some, you know, background. Okay, so let's get going. So um, I think, is it possible to dim any of these lights on the screens? Yeah, so I think, um, well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, so I think we'd all be interested in understanding, you know, how all of these galaxies came into being. Um, and, uh, and this is kind of summarized in a quantitative way in these insets at the bottom. So this is the uh, star formation rate as a function of you know, time or redshift, and this is broken down by uh, masses. And to understand these empirical histories, as well as the physical properties of the individual galaxies that are so beautiful there, um, we would want to start with these kind of first two questions. Um, and, uh, Although it's not immediately obvious, they both lead to the third question. And I'll say that I think that something that's especially exciting over the last um, several years is that we're now in a position to actually make quantitative <clears throat> theoretical predictions that you know, say something about this, which are not just um, kind of using some um, tuned or, or empirically fit models. So uh, we're, we're really in the business of making first principles theoretical predictions. So that's, I think, pretty exciting. Um, and in particular, you know, star formation is currently slow, and I'll explain what I mean by slow. And it was faster at high redshift. You know, certainly in this sense of the star formation rate was higher, but um, the average you know, specific star formation rate was also higher. That is per unit gas mass. OK. So as recently as 100 years ago, it wasn't even known that there were other galaxies beyond our own. Uh, now we know observationally a great deal about these uh, island universes. So especially from local galaxies in our nearby universe, um, but increasingly from galaxies that are more distant. So surveys um, are now at much higher resolution than they were 10 years ago. So it's kind of 100 parsec scale resolution as opposed to kiloparsec scale resolution for these nearby galaxies. Um, you know, thanks to uh, the uh, many of the recent, um, both, you know, both the IFUs for optical and ALMA for the radio. Um, and so if you are going from a, hundred, from a kiloparsec to 100 parsec, and if you have 100 galaxies in your survey, versus 10 galaxies, you know, that's a factor of a thousand increase. So that's really a very large increase in sample size. And I won't go into the details of the observations because we had talks by Adam Leroy a few weeks ago, Janice Lee in the fall, but in summary, if you put together surveys like FANGS, that gives, will give a, a joint catalog of something like 100,000 star clusters and about a million pixels, which are joint distributions of gas and dust and star formation properties. So that's a lot of information. 
um, which is at pretty high resolution and basically resolution that's high enough that it actually can tell us something about the physics in some quantitative sense. So, uh, so the transformation from the, you know, the boring initial conditions of the universe to uh, all of these interesting galaxies are driven by processes that take place in the interstellar medium. And so we can think of galaxies as factories where the ISM is converted into stars, and I'll discuss how that works. Um, but one thing that you can see right here is uh, these, you know, it's color. So the red patches here are the regions where there are young luminous stars that have ionized their surroundings. So you're seeing, you know, H2 regions here. And um, so this and other forms of feedback end up determining the star formation rate. So that's an interesting, unusual kind of factory in which the product, that is the stars, are determining the rate at which the assembly line moves along. So, you know, these are factories, but we are an unusual kind of factory. Uh, so star formation broad brush means collecting a lot of material from a large scale, packing it into a small scale, going from the ISM to the star is a factor of 10 to the 24 increase in density. So that's a big increase. And, you know, it's partly, but not entirely due to gravity. Uh, but even though gravity is really driving this, the measured star formation rate is a factor of 100 less than kind of the maximum rate that it could be. That is, if you took the gas mass and you divide it by the free fall time, which is 50 million years, average less ISM density or, you know, an order of magnitude lower the density um, of molecular clouds. So star formation depends on the competition, actually, between compression by gravity and by, you know, turbulence um, and dispersal of gas. And so the things that tend to disperse the gas, um, that is the support, are, are generally affected by dissipation. And so sustaining the ISM limiting star formation really requires energy. There's no way around that. And most of the energy comes from stars themselves. And because that is the result of uh, collapse and star formation, we call it feedback because it's returning due to the star formation. Okay, so I'll talk about these in, uh, in detail, but just to see where we're going, uh, the feedback mechanisms in this primer uh, that I'll talk about are the heating from radiation, the photoionization um, from the, from the uh, um, EUV, the radiation force, uh, which is just the momentum carried by photons. I'll also talk briefly about solar winds. Supernovae are quite important, and I'll say a little bit about cosmic rays, not that much. Although I work a lot on cosmic rays now. Um, okay, so the, before I go into the details of this, I'll, I just wanted to kind of say, you know, what is the overall concept of self-regulation? And um, so that's what I've written out here, basically. So the basic idea is that the cooling time and the turbulent dissipation times are short. And what I'm showing, showing down here is basically cooling time. So that's cooling time times the density. So you would divide by the density to get the cooling time in years. And, um, you know, if you look down down here, those time scales are, are pretty short, right? If you compare it to any galactic time scale. So that's, you know, it's a million years in the warm gas, it's a factor of 100 less than that in the cold gas. So those are kind of short time scales compared to the dynamical times. So the cooling and the turbulent dissipation lead to cloud formation on large scales. And within clouds that form, it leads to localized collapse, that is to make stars. And then when the gas collapses to make stars, that's when you get the return of energy and momentum. And a uh, key is that the uh, lifetimes of the stars that do most of the essential feedback are, are quite short. So it's like 10 million years, you know, a few tens of million years. So that means that the injection of feedback is rapid compared to the evolution time scale of the system. So you can think of it as kind of, it's not perfectly instantaneous, but there's not a, a long time delay. So star from, when you say star formation feedback, it's actually stellar evolution. A lot of it, but stellar evolution is relatively short. Um, so, so what does the energy do? Well, it transforms the thermal state that is offsetting cooling. Uh, it accelerates the gas, uh, which offsets turbulent dissipation, and then it can, you know, those things together can both limit local collapse and remove fuel from some range of scales. 
So that means that star formation now can regulate the near future state of the ISM and the you know, star formation over longer time scales. And we use radiation hydro simulations, radiation MHD actually, to quantify this. So this is a little uh, shaky because of Zoom. It's, it's nothing wrong with the movie. Uh, but over the years, I've worked with many students and postdocs on developing increasingly realistic models of the whole ISM, uh, which is a complex system. So here's a movie of one of our recent simulations. Um, so this includes uh, ray tracing for the um, UV radiation, and we have a non-equilibrium model for the heating and cooling and the chemistry. Um, so that means photochemistry of key species that are important for heating and cooling. And you can see, you know, if it weren't so um, uh, jerky, you could see essentially all of the phases of the ISM uh, that are important, as well as the feedback processes that are at work. So, you know, for example, here, this is a vertical, these are all vertical slices, and these are slices through the mid-plane. Actually, the, this is a surface density map, and this is an emission measure map. Um, but uh, you can see, you know, so if you look at different different maps here, you can see, you know, in the temperature, you can see the hot phase, which is hot ISM. Uh, the yellow is the warm ISM, which is actually most of, fills most of the volume and is most of the mass. Blue is cold ISM, so you can see these little blue bits here in the middle of the um, warm. So within dense clouds that condense out of the diffuse ISM, that's, then there are star clusters, and you can see uh, the star clusters, a little bit hard to see here, um, but then their radiation is leading to this emission measure map because the ionizing radiation gets out, ionizes the gas, um, and also when there are supernova, that is where that hot gas comes from because shocks propagate out and uh, heat the gas. And um, so the the uh, the other thing that you can see, which I will not be talking about in any more detail, is that the flows vertically. So there is hot gas flowing out of box in both directions. That is a hot wind, and it also carries warm gas with it. Um, not necessarily all the way out of the galaxy. It may make a fountain flow depending on the gravitational potential, though. Okay, so I'll talk about details. Of these processes next. Okay. If can you uh, tell us a bit about the simulation itself? So this is uh, just a kind of region of the galactic piece. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a bit. But oh, do okay. you have other questions? No, no. I mean, it's a patch. It's basically a patch, kiloparsec scale patch, vertically seven kiloparsecs. Is a shear motion established? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, shearing mm -hmm. box. And what, what? And you do this. Uh, you do this uh, thing. Such, so tall, uh, just to capture this uh, outflow. Yes, so. because we want to. We want to. I mean, you want it to be tall because you want it to be. You know, capture this fountain region, mm -hmm. and then the we. So we want to actually know how much is actually. If you cut it off in too small z, then you know, it's first of all, you lose too much gas, and also then are not following properly the fountain. And is this gas unbound? Actually, the hot gas is unbound. Okay. The yeah, the hot gas is you know it's leaving at three hundred kilometers a second, and it, that has not even fully opened up, so there will be further pressure gradients. So so the Bernoulli parameter is high enough that it can leave. Uh, you know, can leave. the warm gas is not such high velocity. The warm gas is maybe you know twenty to fifty kilometers a second. So that's why there's a fountain of warm gas. You can see it you know going up and. And these are grid based simulations, actually. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So the resolution is a few parsecs. Oh, okay, thanks. <clears throat> so, which is quite important, actually. Okay, so um, so I'll talk next about, you know, what's, so this was my timeline. Uh, so we've done, um, you know, the first step already. Uh, so quantifying feedback. So, you know, this is, a region where you see feedback in action. So this is 30 Doradas in the LMC. Um, but much closer to home than this is Orion. So this is, you know, actually, I know where the Orion constellation is. Some of you may as also know. Uh, so this is the closest location where massive stars are forming. So it's a good laboratory for us to um, look at those effects of feedback. And uh, so I won't, you know, go through this in great detail, but 
some of the things that we'd like to, you know, there are many interesting aspects of feedback, but two especially important things we want to quantify are what is the thermal pressure from heating and what is the momentum injection? Because those, you know, reach larger, both affect the birth cloud and they also affect larger scales in the ice center. So, um, so a key is what the stars themselves provide. And so what I'm showing you here is the energy and momentum inputs. This is just based on Starburst 99 with the fully sampled Krupa IMF um, and Geneva tracks. So this is showing radiation broken into some different bands. So these are the bands that we follow. Uh, so line and continuum, that's ionizing radiation. And then these two are the far UV. So Lyman Werner, which associates um, hydrogen. So it's important for, for that reason. Uh, and we group these because both of these actually lead to the photoelectric effect on dust, which is the main thing that is actually heating the um, most of the mass in the ISM. Um, and uh, so you can see here that the, you know, so this is just the different bands of radiation. You can see the Lyman continuum drops off quite quickly within about 5 million years. So ionizing radiation is there, but it drops off very quickly. Uh, then this is the combined, you know, that's the combined far UV. So that lasts for, you know, basically tens of millions of years. So the far UV lasts a pretty long time. Um, winds are, you know, pretty brief. Supernova, again, lasts for about 40 million years. So this, you know, goes up, keep, keeps going. So just based on the lifetimes of, of massive stars that, you know, can produce the supernovae. Um, so... So this is, you know, just some things about the radiation. Uh, why is radiation important? Well, one reason is radiation is important is that that is actually the main energy input into the interstellar medium. Um, so you can see that there is, you know, a factor of 100 more energy and radiation than there is from supernovae. Um, now, that doesn't, you know, just the quantity of radiation does not by itself tell you the relative importance because... What matters is how that couples to the ISM, and, and I will I will get to that. Um, but uh, you know, just quantitatively, it is the main energy input. Um, and I'll I'll talk about momentum uh, later. But this is just the so mom, the the injected momentum is really only important for momentum uh, for for radiation because for supernovae. They do a great deal of work, and you actually have ten times as much momentum as the in initial momentum that's injected. So, so you wouldn't really want to look at that. <laughs> um, okay. So, what does the far UV do? So, the far UV is very important for heating in the ISM, um, and uh, through the photoelectric effect. So, this is the main heating in our galaxy at solar metallicity um, in both atomic and in the diffuse molecular gas. So what's shown here is the classical diagram of you know, density versus pressure. That's the thermal equilibrium curve with you know, the field is the F, FGH. So that's the warm field. Goldsmith is the unstable one and hopping is the cold one. Um, and so, uh, as I said, the, the time scale cooling times are short. So you expect to reach thermal equilibrium. And in fact, that's, what you see. So this is from a simulation that's showing what the instantaneous uh, equilibrium curve looks like and how the gas populates that. And so it really wants to be in thermal equilibrium because the time scales are short. So, uh, so what is the characteristic pressure? If you take the geometric mean of this maximum warm and a minimum for the cold branch, that gives a, a P over K of about 3000. But you can see it's fluctuating up and down. So why is that? because the heating is changing. Star formation rate changes, heating rate changes. Okay, so uh, so as you change the heating rate, so this is just showing, you know, for different interstellar radiation fields, the, this, um, the temperatures, characteristic temperatures are really not changing that much, but uh, what does change is, you know, P min and P, um, the, this maximum pressure of warm and minimum pressure of the cold. So as those, you know, you can then characterize that in terms of the cooling rate um, at the minimum and maximum. So that ends up telling you that you expect the, that characteristic pressure to vary with the heating rate. So the heating rate varies with the radiation field and with the photoelectric efficiency. 
um, and with the abundance of small grains, which are what the photons are incident to and kicking the electrons out of. Uh, so that radiation field depends on uh, on the star formation rate because that's where the radiation is coming from. If but yeah. you have a variation in the star formation rate by just an order of magnitude, right? Say that again. Uh, the variation of the star formation rate is. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the you it I goes mean, from 0.3 to 3. I mean, here, this is just showing, you know, an arbitrary uh, radiation field. But what was your... Well, it seemed like the different curves correspond to different uh, star formation rates in the galaxy. Yes, 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 they would. And why why does the pressure changes by more than an order of magnitude? So... I would think that, you know, you inject 10 times more heat. Because it scales with the heating rate. So the pressure is responding to the heating rate, yeah. you know, through a balance of heating and cooling. But it seems to be changing by more than an order of magnitude. Um, you mean going from? No. Well, one of one of these peaks of pressure, um, well, from the lowest one to the top one. I mean, that's what. Oh well, it's not. Pollution. It's not exact. So there is also these other factors, right? So the photoelectric efficiency actually does change as well. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so that photoelectric efficiency is not a constant. Uh, so that depends on conditions. It depends on the radiation field. It also depends on the um, the electron density because you know the photoelectric efficiency is. You can ask Bruce about for the, the real story, but basically it cares what the charge is on the grain. So the grain charging affects you know whether it's easy or difficult to pick off electrons. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, okay, so um, so in addition to the photoelectric heating, cosmic ray heating can be important, especially at low metallicity where there's less dust, because cosmic ray heating does not care about dust. It's just it's just ionizing. Um, it's just kicking out you know electrons because of the cosmic ray ionization effect, basically. So um, what's shown here is just you know. Um, this is again for different radiation fields, and then this is for different conditions of um, metallicity and uh, dust abundance. So, this um, if you just fix the um, the metallicity and the dust abundance, then you know you just have this radiation field scaling of the this pressure. But it's more complicated if you allow for um, you know the fact. So if you so if you look here. Uh, you know, this is allowing for also different dust to gas ratio. Uh, but what, um, you know, there, so there is uh, the, the cosmic ray rate also depends on the star formation rate because it comes, the cosmic rays are, are produced by supernovae. And there's some shielding at high columns. So, but it, it, the basic scaling is with star formation rate. Okay. So, um, so now let me turn to momentum. Um, because momentum is what drives turbulence, and tur turbulence is very important. Uh, so this is just, you know, a schematic of what everyone knows about, which is strong wind sphere. Now this is inside a cloud, and if you do ionization recombination uh, balance in the interior, um, then you, you know, multiply by the pressure force on this spherical surface. You'll find a force that. You know, varies as the square root of the size of this ionized bubble and the square root of the ionizing photon rate. And you could then ask, well, what momentum would you get? What rate of momentum injection per unit stellar mass if you averaged over the IMF? And that's what I've written out here. Um, since this is per unit stellar mass, this is decreasing at higher stellar mass. So effectively, it, it becomes, you know, Per unit stellar mass is less important for higher mass clusters. Uh, but ideally, if you you know had these ionizing photons on for five million years, you could get you know some some range depending on the cluster mass of between a hundred and a thousand kilometers per second in momentum per mass. Um, so for radiation pressure, uh, you know you're just taking the luminosity dividing by C for the radiation force, and you could do the same calculation. Um, so do this for, you know, 10 million years because the um, non-ionizing radiation lasts longer and you could get of order 200 kilometers a second momentum per mass. 
um, which is higher for the high mass cluster. So basically, if you're you know in a region which is high mass cluster, this is actually more important for more massive clusters. Um, okay, so uh, I won't go into the details here, but we can you know we've done many simulations of individual clouds with uh, feedback from radiation uh, where we use adaptive ray tracing to follow the radiation field. So that's important for getting. Um, a, um, you know, an accurate uh, radiation field. And this is just showing, you know, an example from a simulation of John Yu Kim's, really? Okay, so, um, and you can see, this is the clouds evolving and you can see the emission measure here. Um, and, you know, it should remind you of what some of these lovely pictures look like in the halls that have been uh, updated recently, uh, where you have these columns. Okay, so the net forces. So something that's interesting here is to actually look at what the net forces are compared to that spherical cow, and that's what's shown here. So these are the actual forces of the radiation. So this is, you know, the radiation force is the um, shown in red, and the uh, I'm sorry, in, in the uh, radiation is in blue and the thermal force is in red. And what this is showing, if you just look at the solid, this says that the actual force is lower by, you know, by a factor of five or 10 compared to that spherical version. So, uh, so and the basic reason is that um, you know, radiation is, of course is reduced because the gas is clumpy, so radiation escapes. Sources are distributed, so they're cancellation, um, and uh, and also you know that that anisotropy means that all the pressure forces are reduced as well. Okay, so keep in mind that you know the spherical is useful for scaling because you can see that you know this is these are all reduced by a comparable level, but the uh, quantitatively you know it can be your your spherical version can be an order of magnitude off. Is there a good reason why the thermal forces are overestimated <laughs> much more than uh, the radiation pressure force? Um, because I would say just the radiation pressure force is still mostly outwards. Um, you know, it's still mostly outwards, whereas thermal pressure forces are always along the gradient, which can be in many different directions. Uh, if you just think about that interface, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's basically not just yeah. outward, I would say, because there's more of a geometric effect. Um, is there a resolution dependence to this factor? Oh, uh, to the factor? Well, you do need to have high enough resolution to get it right, but you know, we did a convergence study, so yes. Okay, so I would the factor of five or 10 things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this, and this is just kind of quantit quantifying the momentum yields you would get. So, you know, if you look at a cloud like Orion, which is around here, that's saying that the you know, the momentum uh, yield that you get is of order, um, you know, 100 kilometers per second, which is the momentum per, per stellar mass. So 100 instead of 1,000. Okay, so stellar winds, you know, you might think that they would be quite important based on the energy injection rate and classical solutions of, um, of uh, stellar wind bubbles. So, uh, you know, this is the classical solution. Um, so you might expect that you would actually get a lot of momentum, you know, in, in uh, 5 million years. But realistically, most of the energy is lost to cooling in what's you know, shown, what's shown here looks like, oh, you know, this would be great. But actually that interface is uh, very turbulent and that ends up uh, losing you know, means that the, the hot the energy in the hot gas gets mixed with, you know, some polluted by, by denser gas, and then you're basically at the peak of the cooling function, so you can lose the uh, energy very quickly. So basically, all that you have left is the momentum. You can't get rid of the momentum. Um, and then it ends up giving you a momentum injection rate that's pretty similar to what you get from the radiation force. Um, and this is just maybe since uh, yeah, you can see this very strong cooling here at the interface. This is the cooling rate. Okay. All right. So supernovae are 
uh, important because they are creating the hot ISM, which can leave in a, in a wind, but also because that hot bubble accelerates the warm and cold gas, which is most of the mass. And uh, so something to keep, I, I mentioned before, is that the final momentum injection is about 10 times the initial value uh, in, of the ejector because the bubble is doing work on the surroundings. And um, I'm not gonna try to run any more movies because they don't look very good. Uh, so, you know, so actually stars are clustered, but that doesn't make a big difference to the momentum because the blast wave still creates a shock and that shock propagates into the surrounding medium it accelerates the gas. So averaged over, um, um, you know, averaged over the IMF, so, uh, then the, you end up having a momentum per mass, which is, you know, 10 times higher than you would get from the early feedback. So you get something which is on order of um, uh, the, the momentum per mass is about a thousand kilometers a second is 2,000 kilometers a second is typical compared to about 100 for radiation. And something that you might wonder about is how this depends on metallicity. And the um, momentum injection is actually pretty insensitive to metallicity. And um, you, know, you can understand that kind of based on the details of the cooling function, but basically it's, it's pretty insensitive to metallicity. So that that will come back later um, when I talk about you know kind of putting this together in a, a more you know global models. So the basic conclusions are that if you're kind of looking over you know the uh, time scales of star clusters, which are five or ten million years in clouds, it is the radiation that is leading to the dispersal of clouds you know, the birthplace of those stars and those clusters. So the radiation is the main thing that destroys um, the immediate, you know, birthplace, but over the lifetime of the all massive stars, um, the most of the momentum is from supernovae. And that is what goes, in, it goes into the diffuse ISM because the cloud is gone. Okay, so that's the brief quant quantification, that's the word. Of stellar feedback. Uh, and so what does that do for regulation of star formation? Okay, so that's what I'll talk about next. So if we look at you know the results from some of these recent surveys, how does the star formation rate vary with the um, gas content? Then you can you know divide uh, the the horizontal axis by the vertical axis to get a time scale, and it's about a giga year. So that's what's shown here for all these distributions that it's a characteristic of the time of gas is about a giga year. So as I mentioned, that's much longer than the free fall time. So it's you know not just gravity, that's kind of obvious. Um, but in fact, this in pixels of a given size, does this depend? Say that again. The, these uh, measurements in the x and y axis, yeah. are they how does the there's some resolution implied when you- Yes, so this is, you know, if you're looking at kind of a kiloparsec scale, if you look at the scale of an individual cloud, then, you know, then what ends up happening is you have some star formation efficiency, but most of the gas ends up being dispersed. So it's, you know, the efficiency um, per, um, over the cloud lifetime is of order one percent. So you characterize things differently when you are thinking about, you know, the scale of a cloud or the scale that captures the whole life cycle of all of the ISM. But so, so it's 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 more meaningful to talk about star formation rate on a larger scale and star formation efficiency on a smaller scale. So these are this plot is for bigger. Yeah. So this is averaging over all the phases of the ISM on kiloparsec scale. As opposed to if you look at a cloud, you can still characterize the star formation rate for, for freefall time. It's actually pretty large in individual cloud simulations. It's about, you know, it's it's not that small. So um, the star formation rate per freefall time is, you know, 10% to between 1% and 10%, depending on the variable pref. Did you have a question? Is this a resolved, uh, sort of a galaxy resolved version of the Schmidt Kanika plot? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's what it is, exactly. Uh, so an interesting thing, though, is that the, the so the reason 
I don't talk about Schmidt kind of cut that much is that, you know, the star formation is increasing kind of roughly linearly with the molecular gas mass, but it is just as correlated with the stellar content. So, you know, a lot of the scatter in Kennecut Schmidt is because it's there's a hidden variable, and that hidden variable is the, the gravitational potential, which is mostly due to stars. So both the fuel and the environment, you know, which is the gravitational potential from stars are equally important um, in setting the star formation rate. Uh, basically, because you know, you could have that amount of gas and it could be distributed over a large volume with, at low density or a small volume at high density because, and that depends on the gravitational field. Okay, so coming back to this self-regulation concept, uh, you can show that the feedback requirements to maintain equilibrium in the ISM can be actually used to predict this star formation rate. Um, so, uh, so how does that work? So it's basically, you know, this part and this part working together. Um, and so I showed this figure before, and so this is showing how the pressure, you know, varies essentially linearly with the radiation field. So this, you know, characteristic pressure. So why does, by the way, why does this matter? It matters because, you know, the warm gas is volume filling, but you don't have star formation unless you have full gas. So the pressure always has to be, you know, the pressure will always want to be someplace where, you know, you can have a cold ISM. Um, and so this, uh, this, this characteristic pressure is proportional to the radiation field strength. And you can make an estimate of what this should look like. So this is kind of an estimate based on a slab model where the um, density is uniform and the source function is uniform. And uh, so, you know, that's an estimate of the radiation field. Uh, but, but then, you know, basically this is proportional to this, the far UV per unit area. And so with that, with all of these scalings, you would expect to have a thermal pressure that varies proportional to the star formation rate. And we call these coefficients yield. So this is the thermal yield. And, uh, you know, if you look at the solar neighborhood, the thermal yield would, the, the units of this are kilometers a second, so velocity units. So for turbulent pressure, you can, you know, either balance driving and dissipation, or you can just look at the momentum flux injected, basically, you know, it's kind of the star clusters are centered at the center of the galaxy, you know, mid plane, and you just get this geometric factor of one fourth once you know the momentum per mass. So that's the prediction for the turbulent pressure. Um, and so that gives you something of the order of 500 kilometers a second for that yield. So the basic idea here is that you expect the, all of the pressures to be proportional to the star formation rate per unit area. And uh, so with this total yield of order 1,000 kilometers a second, when you take the thermal and turbulent and magnetic terms all together. Um, so this is what was in the simulation that I showed you, which we don't have time to talk about in detail here. Um, so we call this Tigers because why wouldn't we, <laughs> if we had the chance to do that? Um, and these are the different generations of Tigris. You know, this is the one that, that uh, I showed you some results from, um, and uh, this is what we're working on right now. Um, so yeah, I'm not gonna play any more movies because they don't look that good. Uh, so this is now looking at the, you know, this is the radiation field. So I, this is showing you the radiation field and actually showing you the radiation field in comparison to that uh, simple slab estimate. And it actually works remarkably well. So that's good news for people who do not want to follow the radiation with ray tracing because they could actually make an estimate of it based on properties, you know, just the average star formation properties, which can be very useful if you don't want to do the expensive ray tracing. So. Uh, so this is something that, you know, right now in galaxy formation models, they don't include radiation. So they're not actually, you know, modeling the, the heating in any way. And this is just to show you what the pressure looks like. Um, and this shows you that, indeed, the pressure uh, is proportional to, um, 
you know, this is the measured pressure is proportional to that's the thermal pressure, the star formation rate. Um, and uh, that's consistent with observations of the pressure versus star formation. And you can also see the relationship between the measured turbulent pressure and the star formation rate. So in that comparison that you're showing, mm -hmm. I think three slides ago or whatever. Um, Say that again. So in the comparison you were showing between the slab and the yep. submission, yep. how much freedom do you have in the initial condition? And I guess by this, I'm trying to get at the question of um, this agreement, is it something Right, this is this is in some sense one simulation. So you expect that though that this agreement is worn out. Oh, we've done other simulations. Yeah, this is my question. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we've done other simulations. So I mean, you know, it's only it's not so this is, you know, it's still off by tens of percent. Sure. So it's sure. but it's still pretty good. Sure. Um so and that's basically so it's because the FUV propagates pretty far. Uh -huh. Um so you know, that's basically why. So we did, so it's somewhat less good when the optical depth gets higher. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, still in an average sense. Uh, yeah, so. Um, and sufficiently in agreement for, if you want, if one wanted to do some global. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do, you know, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to have some heating rate that actually follows the star formation rate rather than you know, using the metagalactic UV, which is what people do, which is kind of crazy. Um, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, so the other aspect of the of the you know self regulation is the dynamical equilibrium. And so, you know, in a disk system, the weight of the ISM has to you know be balanced by pressure. So this is what the weight looks like. And so the balance between the weight and the pressure uh, is just what's shown here. So uh, you know, this is the weight and that's the total pressure. So they are in agreement as you would expect. Um, and so the basic idea of this global equilibrium is that, you know, in order to match the pressure that you need to balance the weight, you need to have some star formation rate, which basically is the feedback from that star formation is what is producing the pressure. And then the pressure is offsetting the weight as um, to maintain this overall equilibrium. And that's what's shown here. So star formation rate versus um, or actually this is actually weight here, and this is star formation rate. Um, so that's the prediction. And then this is the comparison to a number of those observations, fangs, and some other um, edge as well. Uh, so one thing you can say is, you know, what is this overall time scale? How does this depend? The gas depletion time. How does it actually depend on the parameters of the, the problem? Um, and so, you know, I've just written this here in terms of the yield, and basically the depletion time should vary proportional to that yield divided by the gravity. And so, you know what gravity looks like, and that yield we've quantified uh, as a function of you know, the pressure, which is something you can measure on large scales. And so. You know, this you can write it in different ways. So you could write it as a ratio of this yield divided by the velocity dispersion if you want to scale to the dynamical time. Um, and the basic point is that the depletion time is increasing for a larger yield uh, and uh, decreasing for a larger gravitational field. <laughs> so, one, one basic observation that's been around for a long time is that. If you look at the vertical velocity dispersion in the gas layers of this galaxy, it always comes out to be about between six and ten kilometers yeah. a second, mm -hmm. and that's a. I mean, it can slower. be a bit higher, yeah. Well, yeah, but it's a much slower. That's for galaxies that seem to have low and high star formation rates. So there seems to yep. be some kind of mechanism. Yeah, so it's insensitive to. So does that come out? Yeah, oh, it comes out of the simulation certainly, but it's not. So we don't, this theory does not make any prediction for the velocity dispersion per se. So that's a separate, it makes a prediction for the turbulent pressure and the thermal pressure, but not for the velocity dispersion. Well, sorry, if you have the turbulent pressure, why does it have to the velocity? Because, because the, it also scales for the density, right? So, so it makes a prediction for the pressure, but not the velocity dispersion. So the velocity dispersion actually depends on the correlation of star formation. Uh, but from the simulations. Um, but you have a layer, you're simulating yep. a layer 
And isn't that a number that you could calculate? So, as I said, it does not make a prediction for the velocity dispersion. This theory, as it is, the simulations, of course, do, but the you know, the simple theory does not. I mean, that's a remarkable observational fact. Yeah. So the simulations give a you know, and as I said, it really has to do with the correlation of star formation, space the space time correlation. What do you mean by the correlation? The space time, how clustered is the star formation? That affects that. That's basically what controls the velocity dispersion. But that you, you know, that's that's kind of a higher order effect. Mm -hmm. But it, but basically, it's pretty insensitive to the clustering anyway. Or um, yeah. So this is just showing how these yields vary with metallicity. So um, this is higher weight, um, and red is lower metallicity. So the yield is higher at lower metallicity, as you would expect, because um, the radiation can propagate further, and therefore heat gas at larger just in you know photon and instance. And uh, the turbulent yield, that's what's shown here, varies less with metallicity because the momentum is less sensitive to the metallicity. Um, and then, you know, what's shown here is the total yield as a function of this weight and metallicity. So, uh, so let's ask, you know, how could you make use of this in galaxy formation modeling? So what people do now in cosmological galaxy formation simulations with big boxes um, are they have very simplified uh, prescriptions, which are basically empirically calibrated. But another thing that is not usually appreciated, I think, including perhaps previously by the people who do this, is that the gas is unresolved. That is, the scale heights are not resolved in these simulations. So although they use the gas to set the star formation rate, they use the measured gas density in the simulation, it's not resolved. Um, so if you actually, you know, so, so it can be marginally resolved in the highest resolution simulations like TNG 50, the spatial resolution is one or 200 parsecs compared to 300 parsec scale height of the ISM. But, you know, if you go to lower resolution as you need to for a big box, that scale height is not resolved. And so the density is not a meaningful quantity in the simulation. It's basically, you know, numerically diffused over a much larger scale. So it's not a meaningful. So you have to essentially rescale the coefficients, you know, in order to get it to match. Um, and uh, so this is just showing that fact. So this is showing, you know, this is the, I wish that this screen were bigger. Uh, then you could see this is the ratio of pressure to weight. And so uh, what's shown in the heavier line is you know, the distribution function from TNG 50. Uh, so the pressure matches the weight reasonably well. But if you go to TNG 100, the pressure is distinctly lower than the weight. Um, and if you went to, you know, we didn't even bother doing TNG 300 because that would look even worse. Um, so, but the good news is that you can actually make an estimate of what, you know, so this is using what the weight should be, but you can in a simulation, you know, even if you, uh, you can actually do better than just using what's on the grid um, by kind of looking for what is a more robust variable to use. Um, and so that's something that we're working on as part of the LTU collaboration. So the basic idea here is that, you know, it's very challenging to resolve the true vertical scale height, um, but uh, in a big box simulation, but it's much easier to resolve the radial scale length, right? So that's, you know, kiloparsecs. And if you resolve the radial scale length properly, then you know the surface density, and if you know the surface density, then you can make a good estimate of the weight. And so that's the basic idea here is that, you know, at much lower resolution, you can make an estimate of the weight. And we have calibrated the relationship between, you know, the yield and the weight. So, you know, then we can provide a recipe for what the star formation rate should be uh, based on things that can actually be um, measured in, in these at the resolution of big boxes. So, uh, so the other aspect of this is that typically in cosmological simulations, uh, the assumption is that the, you know, the star formation rate or the depletion time is just varies with the, this pre-call time or the dynamical time inversely with a constant efficiency. 
But what's shown here is, so this is the uh, depletion time versus dynamical time. So this is what they actually use in the in you know TNG and other simulations to do a similar thing. Basically, about two percent efficiency per dynamical time. Um, but this is what comes from our simulations. Okay, so from the simulations, the depletion time is much shorter at short dynamical times. Basically, uh, because you know the yield is lower at high density and the velocity dispersion is. Is high. So both of those things tend to make the depletion time shorter compared to the dynamical time, uh, you know, in these uh, high density, uh, short dynamical time environments. And you can see that that's a pretty big effect. So that, you know, what we're working on now is to implement this so that we can see if indeed this can, you know, explain the high star formation rates that are now being observed at the high redshift. Can you predict this slope? Uh... Like how it scales with dynamical time. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So yes, yes, we yes, exactly. That I mean that's what we've done. So this is this is based on our um, you know local box simulations. That is our prediction, and then that can be implemented. The idea is that that can be implemented in the low, much lower resolution, you know, kiloparsec scale resolution simulations. Since we have calibrated it with parsec scale resolution simulations, that's the basic idea here. Okay, so I have a tiny bit of time left and I'll talk a little bit about some more detailed aspects of the um, energetics, which are interesting, I think. So, you know, an interesting question is, what are the, you know, this kind of physics drivers of the uh, different you know, quantities in the ISM? And here, uh, I'll just say a little bit about turbulence since we were talking about it before. So this is showing the different velocity dispersions. This is um, this is the Z velocity dispersion, which is important in the, you know, the, the weight, and these are X and Y. And so these are simulations where we turn things on and off, which we can do. And uh, the far left here is the, you know, everything turned on. Um, that is, you know, we have radiation, we have supernovae, um, uh, all of those are turned on. And then these different uh, these different simulations are you know this is no feedback at all this is UV only this is supernova only and you can see if you look at the so these are you know what the velocity dispersion is and you know ten kilometers a second so uh, this is one simulation but it's basically pretty insensitive to the ISM conditions so um, and you can see that in the supernova only it's a bit higher. In the UV only, it's you know somewhat lower, um, and uh, you know if there's no feedback, well, it looks kind of in between. So, um, so, uh, so we can understand this actually. Uh, one thing that let me say first is that you know no feedback. This looks kind of innocuous. It looks like oh, you know, you still get seven kilometers a second. That seems reasonable. Why do you need feedback? But if you actually look at that, it's completely. Crazy. So this is the no feedback simulation. That's the red one. So you know it goes up to an extremely high and completely unlike any observed galaxy like conditions. Star formation rate uses up all the gas. So that's the gas being used up. You know, and then within this you know eighty um, year time scale, it's down to you know that that's basically down to a surface density of one solar mass per. Uh, or square parts. So, you know, this is completely unlike real galaxies. So feedback is important. So that's the, you know, the, the key message is that if you try to, you know, if you try to run a galaxy with no feedback, you will not get anything that is realistic. So that's that's that. Um, what are the gray bands? Uh, so all of the measurements are only, you know, so we, we're not measuring. So the measurements here are just based on this range because we want to have, you know, a more controlled conditions. Uh, so after the initial transients, but before you've used up too much gas, since the gas density is dropping over time. And it seems like all the feedback processes are equally important when it comes to star formation, right? Uh, so, yeah, so they all have, so that's the other thing is that they all have actually kind of comparable, oops, sorry. They all have kind of a comparable average star formation rate, but if you, you know, the average, first of all, that's a much wider range for no feedback because it goes extremely high and extremely low. Uh, but 
otherwise it's you know looks kind of similar so that's kind of interesting in itself so you know there's the average star formation rate seems higher so so you might have said oh you know maybe you didn't need supernova or maybe you didn't so so what's going on there and um so this is now looking at um the feedback yield for the different simulations. So this is the full simulation. So that's the feedback yield. The normal yield is, you know, 1300 kilometers a second. This is uh, where we don't have ionizing radiation. So this is just far UV, uh, but we do have supernovae. And um, uh, this is UV only, and this is supernovae only. So you can see that the, you know, yield is much lower if you, turn off some of the feedback. So how do you still get the same star formation rate? And the way that you get the same star formation rate, so let's look at just you know, the UV only for now. So, so the reason you get the same star formation rate is basically you know, if you look at this, that is, although the yield is lower, the turbulence is also lower. And if you look at the depletion time, which is basically, you know, just the star formation rate divided by gas rate, you can see that the depletion time depends on the yield here, but the velocity dispersion here. So lower yield and lower velocity dispersion can still give you the same star formation rate. So this is the kind of the, the UV only is kind of like a really big molecular cloud because, you know, it's much more, um, it's much colder. It doesn't have a hot ISM at all. Uh, but it can still give you a comparable mean star formation rate, just you know, because because both the yield and the velocity of dispersion matter in um, in setting the depletion time. Uh, so that's kind of you know, but it doesn't look like the ISM, right? So you could still get the same star formation rate, but it doesn't look like the ISM because there's no hot medium. You know, many other things about it are not like the real. I said the star formation rate can look okay. So, you know, this there's another lesson in this, which is you can get an okay star formation rate with something that does not look at all like the real ISM. So uh, I'll say a little bit about energy because this is kind of interesting. So uh, so this is back to you know, what is the total energy input rate? This is V here. This is supernovae. So as I mentioned before, the supernovae, oop, we're running out of I don't. Uh, so, uh, so yes, this is a few orders of magnitude below this, but of course, this UV energy is not all going into heating. So this is the heating rate, which is, you know, this is basically the difference between this and this is the heating efficiency. And then you can actually look at the difference between the cooling, the, the, the net radiative cooling and the net of radiative heating. And that's what's shown here. And the difference between radiation heating, that's this term, and the radiation cooling, which is not shown, is basically the energy input from supernovae. So that is the difference between, you know, uh, you know, so there's more cooling than heating from radiation. Why is that? That's because the supernovae are putting energy in. Um, and so that is, you know, that 1% effect, but it's basically, that's the reason for the excess of heating over cool. Now, if you look at the cooling, most of that, you know, energy is actually lost immediately in, you know, when the supernova uh, remnant becomes radiative. So it's, you know, radiated away at relatively high temperatures. Um, uh, you know, there's a shock, and then there that gets radiated. That energy gets radiated away, but um, some of it goes into driving turbulence, and uh, so, so, um, so you can. So this is something that's kind of interesting when you look at different metallicities. So this is now what I, what's being shown here is the ratio of, of heating to cooling. And this is for different simulations at different metallicities. So as you go to lower metallicity on the right here, the ratio of heating to cooling, that is the, the, the heating, radiative heating to radiative cooling, um, the, you know, the fraction that of the cooling that comes from radiation is actually much lower. So why is that? That means that more of the energy that's coming from um, being cooled away actually comes from uh, something else. And so you can actually, you know, look at this 
uh, so it basically means turbulent dissipation accounts for more of the losses to radiation when you're in a uh, in a, a low metal city system. So if you look at the losses minus gains, and you say that that is comparable to the turbulent dissipation rate, you can write that as you know a turbulent pressure times a ratio of a velocity over time. So that's the time scale. So then, um, then you can turn this, you know, basically put that in, in here. And uh, so this pressure scales with this, um, the, the yield, as I mentioned before. So you basically have a ratio of the turbulent yield to the thermal yield, but the turbulent yield cares less about metallicity than the thermal yield. So, um, so that's basically why uh, this ratio of the radiation gains versus the you know uh, radiation losses depends on metallicity in, in a pretty sensitive way. That is, you know, you're going from eighty percent of the energy comes from radiation to a very small fraction of the energy comes from radiation when you go to quite low metallicity, and it's because of the different scaling of the turbulent and thermal. Okay, so. We are at, we are at lunchtime. Um, I'll go to lunch. So if there's more questions, uh, happy to answer them then. Yeah. Oh, there's lots of questions. Um, you didn't address the uh, production of the IMF. I'm not sure exactly where we go from this to that. That so that is a much smaller scale problem. I mean, right. I'm also working on this, but, but not if that's not a that's so then maybe that's that, a lunch at, but yeah, so that's a lunch. In the beginning of your talk, you showed uh, the um, the Madao plots and you broke them up yep. into uh, masses, I thought, of the of the galaxies. Yep. And there was a trend uh, as a function of the mass of the yes, galaxies the where the sizes. peak yep. where the peak in the star formation shifted. Do you, you have an explanation for that in this context? I don't think in this context, really, because I think that really has much more to do with the accretion history. Um, so, and um, yeah, I think it has to do with accretion history because we're only saying what happens to gas once it gets into galaxies. I mean, I think it will be interesting to see, um, you know, once we, these, like, these new prescriptions have been implemented, Kind of differences it makes. You know, one thing I can say about that is that you know, certainly we would expect actually much higher star formation efficiency at high redshift because of this uh, dependence of the efficiency on pressure. So you would expect to have a higher star formation rate, you know, per unit mass at high redshift because the densities are higher. Um, there are other things about that I didn't talk about about winds. You know, in, it's looking like if you have energy loaded winds rather than mass loaded winds, which is probably more realistic because you know the winds are actually two phase, not single phase. Uh, then preventative feedback may be more important than you know kind of the cycling of mass in and out of galaxies. But yeah, there are, there are, there are many other things that um, in terms of you know the the galaxy formation evolution context. So you mentioned the loss of this vertical. Obsessed about this loss, vertical loss of dispersion. Sorry, but you gave five kilometers per second in the case where there's no feedback. Does that mean if you just actually turn off all the stars, there's nothing coming out of the stars? The, the gas layer will have a velocity dispersion of five kilometers a second. Uh, and how would that work? No, that is. So you mean this? Well, that, would, yeah, that no, feedback? no feedback. No feedback. Yeah, but that is just a crazy model. <laughs> It's like doesn't look like I mean it well, can where is it just energy yeah, what does, what you, it yeah, so you can but it's not is it not zero because there's gravitational energy and collapse but the star formation rate is it's like you can you know from self-gravitating collapse I mean the reason so years ago because the velocity dispersion was insensitive to star formation rate I thought oh feedback's unimportant so I spent 10 years working on otherwise to drive turbulence and you can drive turbulence from you know self-gravity you're basically tapping 
both the self gravitational potential and the large scale potential. So you can you know, drive turbulence, but the problem is you get a star formation rate, which is much too high if you try to do that. So you can, you know, you have the motions that are in collapse, but those motions are in collapse. <laughs> So you're saying that's not actually an equilibrium later, and that's a that's no, no, it's I'm like, so does so that so look so like an right. equilibrium? Does that look like a quasi equal? This is you know not a I mean, it's like yeah, it's different, different things. things. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's not slot, it's just kind of you know collapse. But wouldn't it eventually get to zero? Yeah, that's what it's doing. I mean, I'm just Wondering whether five kilometers is seven. Yeah, it's exactly. Because exactly. Well, I had the same question. Because, of, because you did it at a time before it reached zero. Since it has to be zero. I mean, this is just an average over this. You know, this is just an average over the whole, like, where this is, yeah, so we're not showing here, you know, what is, so the collapse, the velocities vary over time. So these are just averages. Um, I guess I was so. So your claim is that uh, with this model, you would be able to predict the star formation rate that you would have to put into the simulation based on quantities that are robustly calculated. Yeah. Uh, so let's say now you get the star formation rate correct without needing some sort of tuning or. Yeah. But uh, do they have a when when they implement the feedback them and and put some energy back to blow things up or whatever. That's also some sort of hoop. yeah. So that's yeah. What's going to happen to yeah? That? So that's a kind of a separate piece which I didn't talk about. So we're treating these pieces separately. So there's a you know part where you would like to know for a given you know million solar mass or ten million solar mass or <laughs> particle you know what should be the star formation rate. So that's something you know that yeah. basically would say okay this depletion time you tell me the surface density by integrating you know. What the surface density of gas and stars are, I can tell you what the depletion time should be. So that's basically, you know, the rate that you convert gas to stars. But the other aspect, as you said, is, you know, what is the feedback doing on the scales of whole galaxies? So this wind driving, we have also calibrated that is how much leaves, you know, how much energy is leaving in the hot gas, how much mass. Is being accelerated and to what velocities in the cooler gas. So we're also implementing that in cosmological simulations. And one of the interesting things there is that, you know, if you don't poison the, the wind with all this mass, then you can actually, preventative feedback actually seems to work much better. Uh, basically, if you just have essentially a hot wind, which is putting energy in the sea genome, then um you know, so so but the the goal here is to again use calibrations from high resolution simulations that we can then implement uh to say okay this is how much you know high specific energy gas is being accelerated and to what velocities this is how much um, gas at you know low specific energy and then that can be implemented in the in the simulations so yeah, so that's the that, that that that's the other part of the goal. That's the other goal. What is uh, okay? Uh, there is a contribution, a contribution from active galactic nucleus. Mm -hmm. What is today your okay? What is your estimate? Is this ten percent of the total energetics of the ISM? Or this is one uh, percent. Yeah, I think or three hundred. Yeah, so we have not actually done anything on this. I can only say from observations yes, that, that is it just it just does not seem to affect star formation really. You know, you can have star formation and AGN. In fact, that's always been one of the difficulties of how much of this you know observed radiation comes from the AGN versus from you know the stellar content. So. And I think the basic reason is that, the, you know, the ISM is very effective at shielding itself against radiation. And the dynamical part is directed out of the galaxy, not into the galaxy. So I, I really think that, you know, so it matters for the halo and then it matters for the accretion rate, you know, which is the fuel. But I don't think that it's really doing much to regulate, you know, the star formation in the galaxy. But we are very interested because there is this... Uh... Let's say here is it uh, bubbles, mm -hmm. and we measure the velocities and energy yeah. and so on. 
and nobody can say, everybody understands that it's rather fresh thing, only maybe 30, 40 million years. At the same time, we cannot find the real reason that this is stellar mm -hmm. with this 100,000, uh, how, how to say, 100,000 supernovae, yeah, or this is just was, activity yeah, yeah. of I mean, I think it could center, be of, yeah. center of our galaxy, because yeah. energetically center of our galaxy, we know this can produce even that. Yeah. What, what but is your advice? Uh, it is more probable. Uh, I mean, probable. is it is it is it from uh, is it from is it from supernovae or is it from? Yes. Uh, I mean, I haven't not looked at the energetics in detail. I think that you know you can get you can get bubbles, but those are you know just like we see uh, bubbles of hot gas at other places in the disk. But I don't know quantitatively whether the, this uh, bubble can be explained in that way. But it is very impressive. It's very close. And the additional thing, which is, I'm now trying to estimate, the, we measure really what is the density uh, in the level of our galaxy, right, right. so using supernova. And uh, it's again, it's a lot of energy, and we see the turbulence, we see the ionization degree and its continuous illumination of ISM from outside, much more than the uh, X-ray background or extreme ultraviolet background, which is coming, mm, uh, the, uh, how to say, the flag. The flux in, in the plane of the galaxy from our is, much, color, is much higher than extreme ultraviolet. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I mean, but it's still, I think, only affecting the inner parts. It's outside. Yeah. No, 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 no. But, but I mean, the inner part of the galaxy, because the radiation, the, the most important heating is from local star formation. From local star formation. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, with that, I think maybe we should go to lunch, but let's thank you again for.